Hi everybody, it is your AP Biology teacher, Mr. Poser. Today we are getting into the second topic of our second unit, which is topic 2.2, cell size. This is all about cells. Something I didn't really mention in the last video that I think is gonna be, well, I mean, it's important, right? Is to mention that um, if you're in a biology class, you're studying living things, right? And if you're studying living things, you gotta know that the very smallest, most basic unit of a living thing is a cell, which is what this unit is about. Um, and cells are really, really small, all right? If you've ever used a microscope before, you have probably looked at cells underneath that microscope, whether it's in blood, in pond water, maybe from your cheek or whatever. Um, you've had to look under the microscope at cells, um, and you can't really typically see them. Some of them are big enough that you can, um, but typically you are not going to find cells that you can see just with your eyes. Like, I can't just look at my skin and find skin cells, okay? And uh, so cells are small. Um, and why, here's the question that of the day that we're gonna be posing here is, uh, why aren't cells bigger? Okay, you're a human being, you're made of trillions and trillions of cells. Um, and why did life evolve in such a way that um, to get, become more complex, it required more cells working together in groups of, you know, tissues, organs, and organ systems, and that kind of stuff. Why didn't cells just become bigger? Okay, why, why do we have to be made of trillions of cells? Why can't we just be one big cell? Um, that's what we're going to venture out to uh, to find the answer to today. Okay, um, a couple other ground rules about living things here that before we get into the rest of this topic, um, not only do living things need to be made of at least one cell, all living things, that's including you, uh, need to be able to obtain nutrients, eliminate wastes, and dissipate heat. Okay, so where do you get nutrients from? Well, you get them from your environment, right? We get our nutrients by, well, eating stuff, right? Um, and you get your stuff that you eat from your environment, all right, whether you like it or not, from outside of your body, right? So you need to be able to obtain nutrients. You need to be able to eliminate wastes, all right? Not everything is 100% efficient when it comes to metabolism and reactions, right? Uh, there's going to be cellular byproducts, and there's going to be all sorts of stuff that your body needs to get rid of, um, or cells even need to get rid of, um, be you a bacterial cell or a mushroom or whatever, or a, you know, a uh, humpback whale, something like that, okay? You need to uh, obtain nutrients and get rid of waste, all right? Not only that, okay, but because of all these metabolic reactions, these co chemical reactions that are constantly happening um, in your body and allowing for literally anything to happen, a lot of those uh, release excess heat, and they um, so it builds up heat. And so another thing that all living things need to be able to do is dissipate heat back into their environment. Okay, so in order to stay living, what a living thing has to do is take what it needs from the environment and put what it doesn't need back into the environment. There needs to be a constant, and I mean constant, exchange of materials um, and energy with a living thing's environment. And that is, the, that is absolutely essential for any single living thing. In fact, you're breathing right now, you're exchanging materials with your environment, all right? And you're exchanging a little bit of heat with your environment as well. Um, so that is absolutely key for when it comes to living things. Now, let's go down to the size of cells here for a second, all right? You have a surface area, right? You have a, um, your skin is exposed to your environment, um, and that is surface area. Now, the more surface area a cell has, now let's shrink down to cells, okay? The more it can interact with its environment, the more space it has, um, to interact with its environment, okay? Because uh, the more of it, I guess, is kind of like touching the environment, if you think of it that way. It has more of itself to touch in exchange with the environment, okay? And also, think about this. The more volume a cell has, though, the greater nutrient requirement and the, the greater the need is for waste and heat elimination, okay? So the more, vo remember, volume is how much space something takes up, right? So the more volume something has, the greater re energy requirement, the greater nutrient requirement, and the greater waste elimination requirement and heat elimination requirement, okay? So the more surface area it has, the more it can interact with its environment, the more volume it has, the more it requires from its environment. So what are we picking up here about surface area and volume? Two mathematical, uh, well, factors that you can find out about cells. What's the deal here? Here's the one of the bottom lines, ready? The more surface area the cell has per unit of volume, the better. 
okay? Surface area makes it easier for it to exchange with its environment, all right? And uh, the less volume it has, the better it will be at, uh, you know, not requiring as much nutrients or requiring as much waste and heat dissipation, okay? So I underlined it down here. Cells that have a higher surface area to volume to ratio have a more efficient exchange with their environment. Okay, uh, so it is better to have a high surface area to volume ratio if you are a cell. All right, keep that in the back of your head. Now, what we're going to be doing next, and we're not going to do all four of them, okay, but what AP Biology requires you to do is to be able to calculate surface area to volume ratios of four, <coughs> excuse me, four different shapes, a cube, a sphere, a cylinder, and a rectangular prism. Okay, because those are four different shapes that you can find cells in. All right, uh, so let's get some practice. We're not going to do all four for time's sake, but let's get some practice calculating some surface area to volume ratios. All right, and we will start with a cube over here. Okay, so uh, these formulas that I'm going to give you for surface area and volume, they will be given, they will be provided for you on the AP exam. You do not need to memorize them. I would, I mean, if you're taking notes, you should maybe write it down for right now. Okay, but you will not need to memorize it. All right, it will be provided for you if there's a question about surface area to volume ratios, which there probably will be. Okay, but uh, the surface area of a cube right now is 6 times S squared, and S stands for side length, and the volume of a cube is side length cubed you know, to the third. All right, so uh, let's calculate surface area to volume ratio of two different cubicle cells here. One that has a side length of 10 micrometers and one that has a side length of five microliters, micrometers, sorry. Um, so if I sub in 10 for S, all right, I should, put, I should get six times 10 squared for the surface area and then 10 cubed for volume. All right, same thing over here, except I'm putting in five. So six times five squared for surface area and five cubed for volume. All right, and if I'm doing my math correctly, I should get 600 uh, for the surface area of the cube, 1,000 for the volume, uh, 150 for the surface area over here, 125 for the volume over here. Now, um, what does that tell me? All right, as I just mentioned before, the higher surface area to volume ratio that a cell has, the better it is at exchanging materials with its environment. So which one has a greater uh, surface area to volume ratio? Well, we can just calculate. We can just go surface area divided by volume, ready? So if I do that over here, I don't know why it's popping up like that, but anyway, um, surface area divided by volume over here is 0 0.6. That is SA to volume ratio. Okay, but then for my smaller cell over here with five microliter side length, my surface area to, vo to volume ratio ends up being 1.2. Hmm, okay, so half the side length means half or twice the surface area to volume ratio. Interesting. Okay, let's try that for a different shape. See if, uh, see if it holds true. All right, check it out. I have two different spherical cells, okay? Um, one has a radius, R is radius, of 12 micrometers, and the other has a radius of 4 micrometers. All right, and at any time in this video, just pause it and then, you know, calculate this uh, on your own if you want. We're about to calculate surface area to volume ratio of these two uh, spherical cells. All right, the sphere's surface area has a, uh, it's 4 times pi times R squared. All right, and then the sphere's volume is 4 thirds times pi R cubed to the third power. All right, so if I sub in 12 and 4 for my two um, uh, radius, radii here, all right, I should get 4 times pi times 12 squared for my surface area, 4 thirds times pi times 12 cubed for my volume, okay, and then 4 over here, okay, 4 times pi times 4 squared, 4 third times pi times 4 cubed for the volume, all right, and if I do my math correctly, if I do my number crunching correctly, um, oh. I have two of the same slide there. I should get uh, 576 pi. All right, I'm gonna just gonna leave pi as it is, all right? Um, if you make pi into like 3.14159, it gets a little more complicated. So I'm just gonna leave pi as it is. That tends to be easier for uh, sphere calculations and the cylinder calculations that you're gonna see here in a minute. Uh, but anyway, so 576 pi is my surface area. 2,304 pi is my volume on my, my big cell over here. Um, and then 64 pi is my surface area and 85.33 repeating pi is my volume. So if I calculate the surface area to volume ratio of those, surface area divided by volume, okay, over here, I'm going to get 0 0.25 as my surface area to volume ratio, but over here, I'm going to get 0 0.75. So once again, which one of these cells has the greater surface area to volume ratio? 
I'm going to let you figure that out here while I show you the the formulas for the cube and the cylinder, or excuse me, the cylinder and the rectangular prism. Okay, they're right here. We're not going to run through practice problems for these right now. Um, I'm sure your teacher will provide them for you um, at your time. Maybe I'll make another video while we do some practice problems. I don't know, but for the time's sake, we're going to just show you the formulas, show you what we're looking at right here. Okay, but with both of those examples that we just ran through with the cube and the sphere, it's the smaller cell that has the greater surface area to volume ratio. Why can't cells be big? Well, a bigger cell is less efficient at exchanging materials with its environment and requires more resources than a smaller cell. So therefore, a smaller cell is going to have a greater surface area to volume ratio and will be more efficient at exchanging materials with its environment. Bing, bang, boom. Surface area to volume ratio is the key factor here. Okay, so cells can't be gigantic. They can't be uh, they can't be huge on account of their surface area to volume ratio, among other things that I'm going to talk about here. Okay, this is why cells have to be kind of small. Okay, and then why when life became more complex, life became just more groups of specialized cells working together rather than just cells getting bigger and bigger and bigger because they can't survive. They can't you know exchange materials if they get too big. Okay, not only can they not exchange materials as efficiently, but the rate of heat exchange decreases in larger cells, okay? So the heat um, the heat produced by a larger cell does not dissipate as easily as it does in a smaller cell. Smaller cells exchange proportionally more heat, all right? Because once again, they got, you know, they got more surface area per unit of volume to deal with. Okay. Secondly, here, smaller organisms tend to have a higher metabolic rate um, per unit of body mass than larger organisms. Okay, So larger organisms require a greater metabolism. Um, they require a whole lot more reactions and faster reaction rates than a smaller organism does. Um, so hence, once again, smaller organisms tend to be more efficient with their reactions and their metabolic, uh, their metabolic rates. Okay, now here's the thing about that. Large cells do exist, but they have specialized structures to increase their uh, surface area for material exchange. So this is just a cartoon one here, um, but one of the world's largest free living cells is what's called an amoeba proteus. You, this is one that you can, might actually be able to see very, very closely. If you look really closely at a, uh, at a microscope slide, you might just be able to see it on your own. Um, I think I had a video of one just earlier in this video, but uh, it's, it's pretty big, but check it out. Do you see its membrane over here? It's going, woo, it's very convoluted and folded. Hmm, interesting. It has a whole lot of extensions coming off of it. Does that remind you of anything? Maybe from the last topic video? Okay, well, membrane folds in some cells and in cell, some cell structures increase surface area without increasing volume. Okay, so check it out. Here's my good old mitochondria again. Remember how I tried to make a point that was like, oh, the inner membrane is very folded. It's very convoluted. It increases surface area. Okay, that surface area makes it more the inner part of that cell. It's called the matrix, or excuse me, the inner part of the uh, the organelle. More efficient, it's going to be better at exchanging materials with its environment, right? Because there's, like I said, with the mitochondria, different things happen in different parts of the mitochondria, right? What's made in the intermembrane space becomes, uh, excuse me, in the matrix um, becomes important for what happens in the intermembrane space and in along the membrane of that, uh, the inner membrane, those folds. Okay, those folds in the mitochondria are called Christi. Um, and then in intestinal lining cells, all right, think about what your intestines do, right? You eat your food, you chew it up, all right, you bathe it in acid to break it down and hydrolyze um, those materials, what used to be your food as much as you can. All right, and then it gets sent through your intestines. Now your intestines don't do any breaking down. What your intestines do, your large and your small intestine, they absorb nutrients from what used to be your food, from your broken down food. They absorb that. Okay, so these microvilli here are structures that intestinal lining cells have in order to, you guessed it, increase their surface area so that they can interact with their environment, on, at least on that side, facing the part where the food goes through, the tube where the food goes through, um, so that they can absorb more nutrients, all right, and therefore, uh, you know, n provide more nourishment for the rest of the body. Um, so once again, increasing surface area becomes a key factor here, Okay.
So just to recap here, higher surface area to volume ratio means more efficiency in obtaining nutrients, eliminating waste, and dissipating heat. So just in case I missed anything or you missed anything of the important points from topic 2.2, here they are. Um, the better, the higher the surface area to volume ratio, the better. That's the bottom line here. Okay, and be able to calculate surface area and volume and thereby surface area to volume ratio for four different uh, cellular shapes, cubes, spheres, cylinders, and rectangular prisms, okay? And whatever you get, whatever you calculate that has the higher surface area to volume ratio, that is the cell that's more efficient at exchanging nutri nutrients, wastes, um, and materials with its environment. Okay, so increasing volume of a cell, increasing the, the space that it takes up, in other words, its size, decreases the surface area to volume ratio, and it inc increases nutrient requirements and waste elimination. Um, so it requires more nutrients, and it requires more waste elimination, and it decreases surface area to volume ratio. So it's better to have a greater surface area to volume ratio. It's better to be a smaller cell. Um, here's some other reasons why it's better to be smaller. Smaller organisms dissipate heat more efficiently and have higher metabolic rates per unit of body mass. Okay, so smaller organisms are more efficient with their energy um, and their, their chemical reactions, um, all their metabolism going on within their, uh, their cells and their body. Um, and finally, a way that cells can kind of get around the surface area to volume ratio and the size uh, relationship is that membrane folds, including the structures such as microvilli, like what we saw with the, uh, with the amoeba and the um, intestinal lining cells, as well as the Christi that we can find folded up in these, uh, inside the mitochondrion. Those all increase surface area for material exchange and that ends up being very important uh, for several cell functions all right that should wrap it up for this topic uh, let me know if you have any questions and we'll see you next time